Welcome to Podcast on Tech Nation. This is a series of podcasts focused specifically on the biomedical and HTM industry. Episodes will be added monthly. Listening to each episode is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. At the conclusion of this episode, you will be able to access a link that will take you to a quick survey. You will be able to download your certificate once you submit the survey. Before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to invite you to save the date for our upcoming MD Expo in Dallas, Texas on April 16th and 17th. You can find more details and registration information for the show at mdexposhow.com. In this episode, we are joined by Tony Bailey, Director of Product Marketing, OT Security of Zubolo, and Keith Whitby, Section Head of Mayo Clinic, Healthcare Technology Management, Cybersecurity, and Operations. They will share how Medical Device Security Program runs. Keith and Tony describe how Mayo Clinic sets medical device security standards, why device context is essential, and some best practices advice for protecting your medical device. My name's Tony Bailey. Uh, I'm Director of Product Marketing for OT Security at Nuvolo. And joining me today is Keith Whitby, uh, Section Head of Healthcare Technology Management, Cybersecurity and Operations at the Mayo Clinic. Um, I'd like to welcome Keith. Uh, thank you very much, Keith, for taking the time to uh, discuss some areas around OT security and best practices for medical device and healthcare facility systems. Good morning, Tony. Thank you for the invite to participate this morning. Um, as, as you mentioned, my name is Keith Whitby. I'm a section head in healthcare technology management at, at Mayo. Um, I've been with Mayo for 22 years, have a variety of, of experiences at Mayo, um, starting out working in, in surgical services directly with the practice and in a few different roles. One as a, a, a prosthesis and core supervisor, uh, then as a systems analyst, handling a lot of the, the uh, system centric type of equipment and systems that um, are used in the operating room. More, more most recently, um, I've, I've joined HTM, uh, and that was about seven or eight years ago. Um, in HTM, I started out as a uh, unit manager for the imaging uh, group out of Rochester, imaging and x-ray. So uh, that group supported all of the, the x-ray, mammography, uh, radiation oncology equipment um, on our Rochester campus. Uh, more recently yet, um, I was uh, promoted to section head, uh, responsible for lab and research uh, across the enterprise. Uh, and most recently, um, I've been uh, placed into this, this uh, section head role responsible for uh, business operations for HTM, uh, for uh, our system support group, which supports uh, our telemedicine practice, uh, also supports our uh, BlueFi RTLS uh, implementation. Uh, and probably most relevant to our conversation today, um, I also manage uh, and have helped to construct um, our HTM information security team. That's great. That's a really good uh, background. Really appreciate that, Keith. Just out of interest, uh, you know, just dialing the uh, the time machine back into history. What what kind of drove you into into this area of work? Just out of interest. Well, I've I've definitely uh, I, I love technology. Um, really appreciate healthcare. Healthcare. Um, uh, I really value supporting the that primary mission of Mayo Clinic, uh, that where the needs of the patient come first, uh, essentially, and really being part of a team that's critical in ensuring that we can we can meet meet that mission or meet those goals. That's great. You mentioned a few things that uh, that Mayo Clinic HCM team. Are responsible for. Would you like to expand on that? I, I, I know you mentioned a couple of areas, x-ray machines and a few other things. Would you like to drill into that just a little bit? Um, absolutely. HTM at Mayo Clinic, uh, we have uh, about 300 staff within HTM, uh, mostly biomed technicians. Um, we do have some managers, obviously, and then some support staff. Uh, 26 shops across our enterprise. We serve over 66 communities, five states. 
Uh, ultimately, our, our HTM group, our HTM division within Mayo is responsible for supporting over 130,000 uh, medical devices, medical systems uh, within Mayo, uh, valued at over $2 billion at this point. Um, we support everything from, from patient scales up to uh, the, the cyclotrons used in our, in our PET CT practice. Um, our, our, our HTM group is, uh, is heavily focused on, on in-house support and service of, of all of those, uh, those devices and systems that you had made reference to from imaging and x-ray to lab and research to, um, uh, to standard biomed equipment uh, that, that people would traditionally think of as, as biomed uh, type devices. Um, again, heavily an in-house uh, focused program, uh, really, with two primary goals in mind. Number one, uh, cost avoidance for the organization, um, really trying to avoid uh, expensive uh, third-party service or expensive uh, vendor-provided service contracts. Um, and, and secondly, just to provide the, the highest quality service possible uh, for the practices that we support. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. From the, uh, from the Nuvolo perspective, you know, we, we think about from the moment um, an organization provisions uh, a medical device, uh, you need to protect it. And, um, you know, we've observed that implementing the appropriate level of device security oftentimes requires some very specific guidelines and best practices. Um, you mentioned lots of uh, medical devices uh, uh, in, your, in your notes just now that are network connected. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, healthcare facilities, oftentimes, you know, we don't always think of that. We, we focus very specifically on medical devices. Are there sort of peripheral areas that are network connected that are, you know, are of concern for you? Um, well, you know, as I mentioned, we have about 130,000 devices in, in our med device fleet. We have tens of thousands more devices in our, in our facilities operations fleet of equipment. Um, our security team within HTM, because we've been doing, you know, a, a, a pretty, pretty solid job uh, with medical equipment, and there's such a um, th there are a lot of parallels between what we're dealing with with medical equipment, medical devices, and what exists on the facility side. Um, we've also been asked to take on the, the facilities operations IoT uh, type equipment that exists within the organization. Um, of the 130,000 um, medical devices that we have within Mayo, um, roughly 40% of, of that fleet is, is considered quote unquote network connected, meaning it's connected all the time or it has the ability to, to connect to the network. And that really encompasses a whole lot of different things on, on both the med device side and on the facilities operation side. Um, so in, in the med device world, um, obviously uh, there's, there's a, a need and a desire to connect uh, most of this equipment to uh, the electronic medical record. Uh, there's a, a need or desire to connect to PAC systems within the organization. Uh, there's, uh, there's uh, because of the accessibility, uh, a desire for more and more remote monitoring and remote support um, of these types of devices. Um, so hence, uh, that 40% that number is, is exponentially increasing year over year. Um, on the facilities operation side, uh, you, you know, things that you wouldn't necessarily normally think of as, as network connected devices are, are absolutely uh, becoming connected and have been connected for, for quite some time. Uh, whether we're talking about HVAC systems, building automation systems, temperature track, uh, temperature tracking type systems that exist within an organization, all are, are connected um, and thus uh, need to be secured. Any... Um... Any things that you've seen connected that might sort of either raise eyebrows or be of surprise to the lay person? I, the other week, I was trying to a colleague and um, they were mentioning that their hospital beds are actually network connected, which sort of, you know, it was quite surprising to me. And any other, any other items that would, uh, you know, be a surprise to somebody? It's, it's uh, really getting to the point where most of the equipment coming in, most of the purchases we see coming through um, include network connected equipment, network connected components. Um, you, you mentioned hospital beds. We've seen it get to the level of granularity where 
where the battery chargers for battery operated equipment, um, and we're talking about surgical drills, surgical saws, that that type of equipment, the 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 battery chargers are actually network connected. Wow. Um, so that that's the level of of connectivity that we're seeing uh, within Mayo, and and I would assume uh, other organizations are seeing the same constant increase, uh, cost is decreasing uh, for, for connecting these types of devices, um, you know, for some of the reasons I had, I had mentioned earlier on. Um, it's, it's becoming, uh, it, there, there's a lot of utility to connecting um, th these devices and this equipment to the network, and, and hence it's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, many of these devices are, are incorporating a cloud component. It's not client service within the organization, uh, but there, there, there is a cloud component to this, this level of connectivity as well. Um, you know, one example might be, uh, handheld ultrasounds. Um, there's there's a number of vendors out there now uh, where you can uh, you, you, you plug a probe into a, a standard iPhone or tablet and uh, the you're capturing patient images, patient video. Uh, those images and, and that video is going out to a, a cloud-based solution provided by the vendor. Uh, where it can be stored, archived, edited, et cetera, and then pushed back down to the healthcare delivery organization. Um, that hopefully provides a little bit of illustration and context into, um, you know, no, number one, the, the concept that uh, there, there's a constant increase to the devices that are being connected. Uh, and, and number two, uh, people are, are really thinking about this different ways and, and the number of the, the, the use cases are, are increasing as well. Yeah, it is. It's, it's pretty surprising. It was certainly surprising to me. Um, when it comes to things like if we hone in on, uh, let's say, device security um, at, at a high level, um, what kinds of vulnerabilities and, and exploits, again, just at a high level, um, you know, have you either observed or would be a concern to you um, around disrupting device operations? Um, you know, to, to kind of bucketize some of the things that we're very concerned about and, and most organizations are very concerned about, um, probably first and foremost, ransomware. Um, I think uh, we, we've all seen articles, recent articles, um, indicating that there have been organizations compromised by ransomware. Um, and and our, our concern is obviously utilizing medical equipment, medical devices, facilities, HIOT type equipment um, as either the entry point or the pivot point um, for that type of vulnerability within the organization. We put a lot of time and effort into, um, into mitigating that to the extent possible. Um, another vulnerability would be um, or either either nation states or other types of actors that are seeking uh, proprietary data uh, that exists within an organization. Um, you know, we have a, a robust uh, research organization within Mayo Clinic, and, and a lot of the data that, that's being uh, aggregated, compiled, stored uh, within Mayo is, is very lucrative. Um, and um, you know, another use case that comes to mind is, is you know, the use of, of resources, surprising as it might be, uh, within, our, within an organization uh, for activities such as uh, crypto mining, even, for instance, uh, where uh, resources are, are being leveraged, the processing power of resources are being leveraged um, to, to actually mine crypto for, for individuals that, that exist out on the, out on the internet. Um, and, and obviously, any one of those those use cases is very concerning. We've put a lot of time and effort into into mitigating uh, th those types of security concerns. Um, and I, I think we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the ways that uh, that we're doing that. Yeah, for sure. And oftentimes, you know, the the lens that sometimes is placed on vulnerabilities and exploits is very much uh, an IT or traditional IT lens. Um, but of course, things like OT security can be quite different. Um, in your experience, um, let, let's say you know ransomware appears within a network, and let, let's say you know the vector was somebody on a laptop, uh, you know, uh, uh, enable some ransomware via the laptop. Should um, should the IT team then be able to apply security controls? Uh, to, uh, you know, potentially a medical device is affected without first informing the HTM team? 
Um, a, a, as a rule, really, our, our program was structured, uh, our, our Mayo HTM security program was structured specifically because of the question that you're asking, uh, Tony. Um, medical equipment and, and facilities equipment, are the, they're very similar and they're very unique from standard IT endpoints. Uh, the, there's uh, the, the unique nature of medical devices and systems really drove us in a direction to, um, to, to facilitate internal resources within HTM actually being responsible for the work that you're describing. Uh, the, the devices in question are, are uh, we're, we're bound by regulatory guidelines from the, whether we're talking about FDA, CAP, JCO, et cetera. We're talking about extremely complex systems in many cases. Uh, we're talking about systems that are critical to patient care. We're not, it's not a, a laptop or a desktop system that's sitting in an office and, and, and you can you know, leverage um, automation and, and IT-ish tools um, to, to mass update equipment. Um, a lot of this is very manual, resource intensive work, standing in front of a piece of equipment um, to load a vendor approved, uh, vendor validated patch or update um, as such. Um, I, I, I strongly believe that, that this work is, is better completed um, by subject matter experts as it relates to the, to the equipment in question. Um, and, and what we found uh, within Mayo is that uh, that group is HTM. We're responsible for uh, medical equipment, medical devices. Um, our team is being constructed to, to really have a cross-pollinated uh, skill set of, of both IT, a blend of IT and uh, facilities and uh, HTM uh, technician-like expertise uh, so that we're well positioned to either independently um, uh, apply the types of updates and patches that, that you're referring to or work very, very closely with specific individuals that support uh, that specialized equipment um, to update and, uh, and support uh, those types of devices. That makes a lot of sense. I think in um, in, in reference to some of the uh, the vulnerabilities and exploits, oftentimes they potentially can uh, compromise uh, patient data, or at least you know that that's the fear. And was wondering for, for a layperson uh, who might might be listening to this podcast, what devices um, typically store patient data on the device, and and why would they do that? Sure, that's that's a great question, Tony. Um, uh, many, many of the devices that we support actually store patient data on the devices. Um, you know, probably the most the most prevalent or, or top of mind uh, type of equipment would would be our, our imaging or X-ray devices, like X-ray units or CT scanners or MRIs. Um, really, I, I think the fundamentally uh, the reason why that happens is so that uh, these these systems and devices can be relatively standalone. They're not required to have a network connection to function. Um, in the event that uh, that the hospital network were to go down or the clinic network were to go down, we would be able to continue to provide uh, to provide patient care uh, via via the equipment in question. Um, subsequently, though, um, wh whether we're talking about a piece of imaging or x-ray equipment or whether we're talking about other systems, physiological monitoring, et cetera, um, there, there absolutely is a need for ne uh, network connectivity um, to, to integrate these types of devices with the electronic, me electronic medical record, to integrate these types of devices with, with PAC systems, which is the, the, the picture archiving systems uh, for, for imaging and x-ray, to integrate with, with our research colleagues so that data can be pulled down and, and leveraged. Um, and and to integrate with other hospital-based systems. So uh, definitely, a, 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 it's very critical that most of these devices are able to to integrate with these other hospital-based systems. However, not required in order for them to function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what in terms of your experiences in in the HCM team there at, uh, at Mayo Clinic? What would you say at a high level are some of the the, the challenges in ensuring device safety and security? Um, yeah, another great question, Tony. I, I think that, you know, some of the, 
um, some of the unique facets of, of medical medical devices. I think we talked about it a minute ago. Uh, but I, I, the, the lack of standardization really is one thing that comes to mind, um, lack of standardization within a large organization. Um, the, the geographical challenges are, are, are certainly interesting where, you know, as I mentioned, we have 26 plus shops across a, a large enterprise, uh, ensuring that um, security is, is occurring. It's occurring in a very standardized way via structured processes. Um, it's, it's trackable um, and it's reportable. Um, uh, another challenge is, uh, you know, obviously vendor dependencies that we're dealing with, uh, where unlike again in the IT world, um, if, if you've, you've covered off with Microsoft, you can install and, and update rapidly on, on your whole fleet of, um, of laptops or printers. Um, the, it's a different world when we talk about medical equipment, when we talk about facilities devices, uh, because of the vendor dependencies, we, uh, we, uh, take great efforts and, and, and put a lot of due diligence into ensuring that anything we're doing on a piece of medical equipment, um, has been approved by and or validated by the vendor, um, prior to taking any action, which certainly adds layers of complexity and making sure that this work is getting done. Um, uh, an, another challenge is the fact that we're we're largely unable to scan a lot of this equipment with with standard tools to to pinpoint vulnerabilities. So it becomes a, a much more manual process, and and uh, you know uh, sticking with that you know that IT theme, um, it's also very difficult or impossible to load agents on on these devices. So we're unable to manage this equipment uh, via those IT like tools. Uh, in mass, and it, it becomes very individualized, and and subsequently, and because of that, um, it's very important uh, that we have very structured processes, very structured systems, and and HTM centric tools to enable us to do this work and and to track it efficiently. Yeah, yeah, that that certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, when it comes to medical devices. Safety is one thing, and, and obviously it's very important. But what about things like um, device accessibility, meaning I can get a device, uh, get at a device, uh, and then availability, meaning it's usable. But what, are, what are the challenges to, to optimizing these? Yeah, uh, that, that's an, uh, another great question, Tony. Um, you know, really patient safety is, is, is paramount. Um, in regards to anything we're talking about. And then ultimately we're lacing in, you know, accreditation requirements, we're lacing in um, security requirements. Uh, however, uh, you know, for another key uh, and, and foundational principle is business continuity. Uh, we want to make sure that the business is able to capitalize on and leverage um, th this type of capital equipment to, to the extent possible. And, and as such, um, it's, it's run uh, frequently and it's, uh, there, there's a lot of skepticism uh, regarding uh, downtime and, and the amount of downtime it takes to, to ensure that uh, that equipment is, is updated, up to date, secured, et cetera. Um, so um, I, I think really what you're driving at is, okay, well, knowing, knowing all of those factors, um, you know, how do you ensure that you're efficiently um, provided the opportunity or you have the ability to stand in front of this equipment and, and make sure that you're, you're running through the, uh, the, the securing of these devices? And while while limiting downtime, and and so there, there it's very important that we leverage um, l leverage the opportunities like when equipment is undergoing um, preventative maintenance. Uh, during that preventative maintenance, let's also capitalize on the opportunity to to make sure that we're updating and loading patches on it, etc. Mm -hmm. Let's be really organized and efficient about you know when we want when we want to get in front of a piece of equipment to make sure that it's being updated. Uh, let's let's coordinate and collaborate with the, the individuals that are supporting this equipment, um, and and the people that understand you know what what you know, what, when this equipment should be up and running and, and when it might be down um, f for the day or for the evening. Um, capitalize on those opportunities um, to make sure that we, we leverage it and, and are, uh, are doing any security related work um, when the equipment's not in use. 
Yeah, I mean, totally. I mean, that, that's the observation that we see working with multiple HTM teams where safety is definitely paramount. But oftentimes what comes into the conversation as well is, is sure, I need to ensure safety, but I also need to optimize utilization for ROI on these millions of dollars that I spent on these devices. So yeah, we yeah definitely seen that. Um, we'll start to dig in a little bit around uh, what Mayo Clinic is doing to uh, to ensure device security, and you you've touched on it in a lot of ways. But uh, you know, I'd love to sort of get at a high level, uh, and we'll dig into this a little bit deeper later on. But at a high level, uh, you know, what Mayo Clinic is doing around device security to ensure device security. Sure. Um, you know, Mayo puts a, puts a lot of time and effort and, and energy into securing our entire, our entire organization. Um, this goes way beyond medical devices and facilities, IOT devices. And certainly we have a, a robust office of information security, uh, within Mayo. Um, and, um, we are, are, I would consider a, a, um, an add-on, a facet um, to, to improving what's happening uh, within our Office of Information Security. Um, we're, we're connected to them, we collaborate with them, we coordinate with them. However, we are separate and unique. And what we had found over the years was uh, that uh, given all of these unique challenges, uh, specific to medical equipment, specific to the IoT type things that exist within an organization, there really is a need for a, an independent team outside of, of OIS that's actually responsible for the operationalization um, of security as it relates to, to these, these medical devices and systems and as it relates to, to the facilities equipment that exists within the, org within the organization. Um, as such, our, our division chair um, had the foresight to really start to build out um, our security team. Um, obviously pulled me into the section head role to, to, to construct this. And, and we built it up with the premise that um, everything that we're doing is really constructed on, on NIST and AMI standards. Um, we constructed a framework based on, based on NIST um, for HTM and for facilities. Um, we've developed very standardized security processes and procedures to take um, what had been happening in an in, uh, in academic fashion, we'll say on the, on the information security side, um, and, and when I when I say that, I'm I'm referring to the the assessment side. Um, what was happening with the assessment is they're coming back with recommendations of, of things that should be occurring on, on these devices, ways, controls that can be applied to ensure that they're being added on our network in a, in a safe and secure fashion. Um, however, there's, there was a bit of a gap in terms of, well, who is ultimately responsible for applying those controls? Mm -hmm. um, who is also ultimately applying for, uh, responsible for ensuring that that is happening in a very standardized way um, across the enterprise? So we've put a lot of time and effort um, into building building out exactly those processes, taking, um, taking those assessments, taking uh, known vulnerabilities, uh, making sure that it's, it's, it's converted into language that, um, that our subject matter expert technicians and associate security under engineers can understand, um, actually being applied to the devices in a, in a very fleet manner or a fleet centric manner um, and that we have the ability to, to track that work and report on that work. Um, our, our team also assists with all of the NAC and segmentation efforts that are ongoing within the organization. Um, the, the team is really meant to be a, a high-end resource for our, um, for our technicians um, and others that exist within HTM. Um, we, uh, our, our security team is, is responsible for um, the vulnerability management program, uh, meaning we become aware of the next, the next RIOC or Deja Blue or Blue Keep, um, and making sure that again, via very structured processes uh, that, that we've constructed, uh, we understand what the scope of a vulnerability is um, as it relates to medical equipment and facilities devices. And we understand what the uh, mitigation or remediation looks like, and we're able to track completion on it. Um, we've developed a, a, a comprehensive uh, risk scoring uh, program for our, our medical device fleet and facilities fleet. Um, we've done heavy engagement with, with other industry groups, uh, ACCE, the FDA, NTIA SBOM efforts, um, and CISA um, efforts. Um, we've implemented some, some uh, 
we, we've implemented an os, automa, uh, automated asset identification tool uh, within the organization, which which is heavily tied in and integrated with uh, with the CMMS that we're using, um, and really tried to automate security workflows to the extent possible um, on the equipment we're supporting. And then the, the you know the boots on the ground resources that we have are. are the, the team that we have is really meant to be embedded with the local HTM shops. Um, they're the security subject matter expert for, for our biomed uh, technicians, really a security point of contact for the vendors as we're doing our vendor inquiry work uh, uh, for vulnerabilities, uh, creating some, some of the procedures and processes as it relates to um, actually app applying controls and uh, on, on the, this type of equipment. Um, and, and really just being a, a solid resource for, for our technicians, for our HTM colleagues, and for the practice um, as it relates to the importance of, of ensuring that uh, the equipment we're supporting is as secure as possible. Um, all of that work has happened over about the last two years. Um, really feel like we're, 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 we're obviously still, still constructing a, a robust program, but we're very mature. Uh, quite a ways down the road and really believe that we're, we're setting a world-class standard um, for how to uh, secure medical devices and facilities devices within an organization. That's, um, and it's really exciting to hear that just uh, standards, experts, best practices. Um, with that in mind in the, in the last couple of years, has there been a situation where a, a new medical device needs to be added urgently to the network, but there's not really a, not really a best price or a standard for securing it yet. Uh, what what happened in, in that scenario? Um, well, uh, I, I can speak for Mayo, and I can say that nothing connects to the, to our network without the the cl device class owner having some level of of insight and engagement to the idea this is coming in, yeah. uh, and and also without some level of assessment occurring on the device. And, and that happens via um, network access control and um, uh, structured processes that have been developed um, you know, within our organization. So we, we definitely know things are coming in and, and it's, we definitely would not connect them uh, without some level of assessment. Um, and beyond that level of assessment then also comes um, some level of, of, uh, of of, of security controls uh, being applied to, to anything that's coming into the organization being connected on the network. Um, we as an organization, even though there may be, there may not be uh, known uh, best practices for securing a device um, at the point with which it comes in our door, um, you know, we internally may be developing those best practices and likely are developing those best practices uh, per our own organizational requirements. Um, and, and then subsequently, um, via the processes that we've built out, are applying um, those best practices on the devices while they're being connected to the network or, or prior to being connected to the network. Um, I can also say we're, we're heavily leveraging tools, again, like, like NAC and segmentation to ensure that, number one, equipment isn't being connected without some level of visibility and, and control being applied to it. Um, and all of this work, as it relates to, to our, our medical devices and facilities devices, is, is really based on knowing we have it, knowing what it is, and, and being able to, to, to track that device in the context uh, related to that device via our, our CMMS tool. So our CMMS is really a foundational tool in making sure that all this is happening. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, going back to really focusing on um, safety first. So no matter what you want to add, you've got to have some kind of assessment in place. Yep. Um, there's, a, there's several um, medical device discovery and security monitoring solutions out there. And you, and you alluded to this a little bit, Keith, but, but what part do they play in, uh, in device security? <clears throat> Yeah, that, that's a great question. They're, they seem to be uh, um, more and more prevalent within within healthcare organizations and beyond. And and the, these automated asset identif identification tools basically sit um, on your network infrastructure and passively monitor uh, network traffic flow. Um, and first and foremost, provide some really granular details um, about the devices you have connected to the network. 
um, those tools are not built to store those those attributes or, or the context about the devices. Um, hence, uh, re regardless of which tool you're using, it needs to, to integrate with uh, your computerized maintenance management system, your CMMS, so that uh, the, these automated asset ID tools are, are capturing the information your your computerized maintenance management system is actually the the inventory of of all of these attributes or details, and, and really the the benefit we've seen from from the tool we use, uh, which is Order, um, is that we're we're able to feed uh, in an automated way uh, information like MAC address, IP address, host name. Um, uh, software revisions, uh, a number of details that historically speaking, we were manually required to go out and find and grab off of this equipment. We're able to, to automate the process of capturing it and feeding it in, into Nuvolo, which is huge. That's a, a, a net gain for HTM. And one of those ways we've been able to kind of automate um, some of the processes that were historically very manual. Uh, the, these tools also provide really data flow context. Uh, device A is communicating with device B via, via specific ports, protocols, and services. Uh, that's valuable information from the vulnerability management perspective, and, and it's just valuable to know that, um, that, that type of detail as you're kind of walking through your, your maintenance process and your vulnerability management process, and, and very useful from what we found for, for NAC and segmentation efforts. Uh, the, those tools also provide risk, security risk context and awareness, meaning um, th these tools are, are typically um, well informed via national vulnerability databases, via uh, th those, those standard CISA or ICS CERT notifications that come out, talking about specific vulnerabilities uh, that, that exist within the industry um, or exist as it relates to specific, piece of, specific equipment. Uh, so they understand the context of a security risk they can see equipment that's on the network. However, th there needs to be heavy coordination, collaboration, and integration, again, with the CMMS to, to put context around what exists within your fleet as it relates to a, a specific vulnerability. So again, that's huge. So a, a tool like Order or an automated asset identification tool um, understands the vulnerabilities that exist. Uh, they, they're able to pinpoint potentially equipment on your network that is impacted uh, by that vulnerability. But, you know, th to put the, the full context of exactly what's impacted uh, around that vulnerability, it, it requires heavy integration with the, the computerized maintenance management system. And then from there, the CMMS um, can, can take that vulnerability and, and operationalize it or plug a workflow in around it to ensure that the, 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 the risk is actually addressed on the network. And then uh, obviously the ability then to, to track that that risk has been remediated or mitigated. So again, uh, it, if, if you want to leverage the automated asset identification tool, um, almost required uh, to to integrate with the computerized maintenance management system and together um, you know I think there's there's opportunity to con construct a very robust uh, security platform um, as it relates to medical equipment and HIOT. That's great. Yeah you, you alluded to um, Nuvolo OT security bringing in um, this device discovery and security monitoring tool information into that single CMMS, if you if you will, mm -hmm. um, and then you know you mentioned a little bit about getting the the context for a security event. What about um, being able to correlate security events across the thousands of devices that you may have in an organization? Yeah, so uh, absolutely. Um, that, that's that's really where the where the net gain of of a, a cyber OT type platform like Nuvolo is offering is going to come in. Um, again, the the visibility to a security issue is certainly provided by your automated asset ID platform, but the correlation you're describing absolutely has to happen within the CMMS. Um, the the CMMS is is your your organ your your inventory 
um, that that maintains, uh, you know, not only the the concept that you have a device, but also the you, you know the the context of that device as it sits on your network, um, the 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 attributes, the details that that sit around that device, um, and and we can talk high level about you know MAC address, IP address, operating system, host name, that that type of of level of detail, but but also, you know. I think we have the opportunity with the, the Nuvolo Cyber OT platform to get to a level of context where SBOM like detail is actually being stored in, in the CMMS as well, um, which provides you light years more context about, you know, taking a fleet of, of, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of devices that may initially be in scope um, for a particular vulnerability, leveraging the data that you have in your in your CMMS, that that rich detail, that rich context, to really whittle down from from thousands or tens of thousands of devices to only the subset of devices that's impacted by a vulnerability, and then even furthermore, then operationalizing that information into a, a work order like structure. Um, to, to trigger work orders for um, for security personnel, for technicians, um, et cetera, um, in a very digestible format or form so they can actually go out and address the issues. Yeah, it's that really critical area, which is it's almost like the, the, the orchestrated remediation and knowing that the remediation steps, you know, are following um, the best practices and standards, if you will, um, that you that you've mentioned earlier on, um, in terms of uh, the, the benefits, uh, could 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 Nuvolo OT security, um, you know, leverage uh, those best practices and security standards that Mayo Clinic is constantly working on in terms of remediation steps? A absolutely, I, I think there's there's. Uh... I think there's lots of opportunity here. We're we're uh, working closely to to construct. A foundationally speaking, um, we're we're capitalizing on what we call security lifecycle profiles. Um, that's kind of the the, the roadmap, the template um, that that ties uh, through the entire lifecycle of an asset. Anything that needs to happen security wise. Um, is uh, on the Mayo side incorporated into this this what we call security lifecycle profile. Um, again, it, it's looking at what we have from the fleet perspective and providing the what needs to happen uh, to to secure a, a device at the model level, typically speaking, um, and that that encompasses everything from uh, from onboarding. Uh, according to your organizational NAC standards or your organizational um, segmentation standards, uh, all of the, the assessment detail that's captured on the front end as you're doing your penetration testing um, or as the, the, the device is being assessed at purchase, um, all of that type of, of uh, control level detail is incorporated into the lifecycle profile. Um, basically anything that needs to happen to that device over the course of, the, of its life to reduce risk of that device. Also at disposition, you know, ensuring that um, we're, we're accounting for um, what needs to happen for that device to be safely removed from the organization. Uh, that's the uh, that's the lifecycle profile level. It's kind of our, our foundational platform for what needs to happen um, on a, a, a particular model of device within within our organization. Drilling down another layer, um, we have what we call security lifecycle profile procedures. Uh, those procedures are really meant to, to kind of replicate or emulate what you would see in a service manual. Really, again, making this very digestible, uh, making the instructions for applying security controls or applying security measures to equipment very digestible, understandable, and achievable uh, by either IT representatives within the organization or by, um, you know, standard HTM technicians that are used to going through service manuals and step-by-step -step kind of walking through the process of applying uh, controls uh, to equipment. And, and really the beauty of that, the, the beauty of, of, of those two layers of, of detail or documentation that we're constructing out um, are, are the idea that number one, you provide a really uh, a standardized template 
to address devices in a, in a in a very standard way across the organization at the model level. And number two, you're providing procedural detail how to achieve the the security measures that are being described in the the lifecycle profile. Um, and the the benefit of that is uh, uh, to put this into context. You know, it's really easy to say change a default password on a Siemens Artis Z uh, radiology interventional radiology system. It, it's a whole nother thing to expect that just anyone is going to be able to go stand in front of that Siemens Artis Z, has the right service keys and passwords to get into that device, get to the appropriate uh, appropriate points within that that piece of equipment, and actually accomplish that work. And that's really what we've driven towards and what we've accomplished with our security lifecycle profile procedures is to provide that level of detail. Step one, step two, step three, this is exactly how you can accomplish that particular control. Got it. It's, it's a fascinating area of work around the profiles of procedures and the remediation plans. Um, Keith, I wanted to thank you very, very much for your time today. It was very enlightening. Um, for people listening to the podcast, um, you can learn more about uh, single device inventories, um, orchestrated automated responses for uh, securing medical devices and healthcare facilities. Uh, you can go to nuvolo.com uh, to learn more. And again, Keith, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks, Tony. Keith and Tony. If you enjoyed today's episode, you might enjoy our ongoing webinar series, Webinar Wednesday. You can find a calendar of upcoming live webinars, as well as an archive of on-demand webinars at webinarwednesday.live. To obtain your certificate for one CE credit from the ACI, please remember to click the link located below this podcast title to complete today's survey. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com.